Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Kleindl, and I'm with Dr. Otto Stein, and we're here today to talk about another kind of sewage treatment facility. This one's unique because it's for a ski resort, Bridger Ski Resort, and it has a closed system. It doesn't directly discharge to a stream, and we're gonna figure out how that works. What are we standing on right here? We're actually standing on the first stage of the, of the treatment process, which would be to separate the solids that would come out from when you flush your toilet or you have your kitchen waste come in. So it comes out the four buildings that you can see here, all of the wastewater from all of the drains and comes into this series of tanks that are sitting down here. And this is what most people would think of as a septic tank, but you wouldn't probably, this is such a large system here. Typically we'd call that a sedimentation tank, but it's the same idea. You know, the flow rates here are about somewhere on the order of around 5,000 gallons a day during the ski season. The water is designed then to sit in here long enough that anything that can settle to the bottom would settle to the bottom and grease and things like that could float to the top. And because we're in a ski resort, it's cold, there's lots of snow, yeah. but this is below the frost line. So yeah, stays. well, it's warm, you know, the it's nice warm thing, water. warm water because yeah. it's coming out of a building, right? Yeah. yeah, typical raw wastewater, even in a municipal system, is, you know, almost about equal to groundwater. So 50 Which degrees or so. 50 degrees. Yeah. Okay, so the so the so, the septage, the solids float, sink to the bottom. Yep. The floaty solids yep. go to the top. The effluent goes out to the next thing we're about to see. Yes, exactly. And what's left behind gets pumped out by the big pumper trucks and disposed of in a landfill or some yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. Once a year, these tanks all get pumped out and that's disposed of in a proper way. But the way that the rest of the treatment works then is to take the water that has now been removed of the grease and the solids and we send that up to the, to the wetland system, which is the part of the, the system that I was really involved with. The liquid parts get pumped up the hill into where we are now, right. which is what? which is an engineered wetland system designed specifically to remove primarily the nitrogen that would be in the water that would still come up and to remove the carbon too. Our waste comes out, it's high in nitrogen. Phosphorus? Phosphorus is too high too, yeah. High in nitrogen, phosphorus. And, and, and organic carbon, carbon. And plants love nitrogen and phosphorus. That's right? one of the issues, yeah. And yeah, then one of the, the, the pathogens, if there's E. coli, it's gonna, something's gonna happen to that. Yep. Yeah, what happens? This is, what is this? This is really tiny. I thought I was expecting some massive Yeah, thing. well, this, this was the original wetland that we built up here. Uh, I had been involved for a number of years with research looking at wetland systems for wastewater treatment. And a friend of mine from Denmark, we were at a conference and he goes, Otto, you got all this work going on with wetland systems, but you don't have a wetland. And I was like, you're right. I need to get one. So it took a couple of years, but a partnership here with Bridger and with Department of Environmental Quality uh, we got a grant to build this pilot system to prove this technology that's per relatively common in Europe could work here in Montana as well. Most of my research and work in my life has been based around wetlands. Mm -hmm. And if I was to stumble across this thing, I'd be like, that's not a wetland. Yeah, I know. You probably would say that, wouldn't yeah. you? So what, is, what are the three things that you have to have to have a wetland? Water, soils and plants that are typically adapted for life in hydric soil conditions. Mm -hmm. Soils, soil plants, plants, and water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, those are there. And if I was to delineate this wetland, I would see it as a wetland because it meets those three parameters. But what's missing is habitat and birds and, and you know, open water and frogs and a boardwalk and, you know, all the other things that you would want in a, in a wetland in, a, in an urban or an urban area. Right, right. Yeah. So I think maybe where you're going with this is that what we're trying to do here is we've engineered what we know wetlands are capable of doing and trying to maximize one service from this particular one, which is primarily to remove the nutrients that would be in, in wastewater that's coming in. And it's mostly being removed by the uptake through plants. No. It's no. mostly being uptake by the microbes that are working within that wetland system yeah. on the roots of those wetland plants. So you take advantage of the biogeochemical processes that occur in natural wetlands, you engineer it, so that it does things that, it provides a service, ecosystem service. Right. I'm standing literally in the wastewater treatment. Yes. Do I need to worry about what I, that I'm gonna sink in, into poop? No, absolutely not. What's, what's going on below my feet? So below your feet is about three and a half feet of sand. So that if we did step, don't break a pipe. 
Don't break a pipe. That's really what, what, what are all these pipes? So the small pipes that you can see here are the distribution pipes. So there's a pump then, that water comes up from the septic tank, the clarified water, the supernatant, the effluent from the septic tank, which is pretty clear. If you were to hold it up in a jar, it would look like a little bit cloudy water is what I would say it looks like. So all the solids are out, right? And so it gets pumped through little orifices, little emitters that come across and the water starts at the top and every two hours or so, we pump on about an inch or so of water and then it trickles on through the three feet of sand and then gets collected at the bottom again. Okay, then what happens? It goes to the next cell, because we're in. Right, well these, these four, these five cells here are in parallel, so they're all identical and the ability here that if, essentially there's a, an engineering redundancy here, if something were to go wrong with one of these, we'd still have four more that you'd be able a, to handle. There's another the four cells above. Yeah, another five so, cells so, up there. It goes to the uphill one first, and yep. that one is mostly saturated. And the water moves through a slightly unsaturated zone and then goes into the saturated zone. That's so that we could get the different types of microbes, ones that like air and ones that don't like air, anaerobic ones working in conjunction with each other. The water passes through that, and then it comes onto this cell, which is all aerobic. One of the biggest issues we have with wastewater treatment is how do we totally remove nitrogen and so we need to go through a nitrification and a denitrification process. And without getting so complicated, but the phosphorus gets bound to the soil. The phosphorus gets bound by the soil or taken up by the plants a little bit. And okay. wetlands are not, this system is not the greatest at phosphorus removal. Yeah, but phosphorus is not a problem. Uh, not when it's a soil discharge system at the end anyway. So remember I said I, th I think about wetlands a lot. I don't think about wetlands that are, have one type of plant. Why right. is this all one type of plant? Well, we picked this plant specifically from previous research that it's we had carex. done. It's a carex species or a yeah. sedge. And we had done quite a few studies looking at what is the efficacy for different plants in this type of a wastewater treatment setting. And we looked at five different species of carex and they were amongst the five best species uh, plants. Because they have deep the roots that go down. You said this is four feet deep and the roots yeah, go yeah. down about the, three feet. The roots go down a long way. There's more below ground biomass in these than there is in above ground biomass. If we were to yank it up, we would get just a bunch of roots. Just a big bunch. And that roots is pumping sugars and pumping oxygen. Oxygen and all that And then there's all the the stuff, the, the, all the water down there, plus all the biological activity, reduces the oxygen, so you get this oxygen anoxic yes. gradients that yeah. are occurring right next to each other. And so you get all yeah. the different types of microbes that you want, that, yep. that in a wastewater treatment plant, when you went to Livingston, they sequence all of those, and here yeah. we have them all growing together right in one unit with uh, along the roots and along the gravel and all this, the biofilm. As we Thank goodness for the microbes, and we'd have to do all this ourselves. They do all the work. They, they do, do all, all the, the heavy lifting. Yeah. The plants just assist. And then you mentioned we run it one more time? We, we recycle it through actually twice. Twice. Is what, and, and that was an experimental parameter that we didn't know at the beginning, but that turned right. out to be best. And right. then it goes from here, then it goes to another tank, and then goes to the final stage, which is the drain field, which is just like a drain field in anybody's individual backyard system. Right here, I, I've skied this run with my kids a bunch. Right over here is the, the jumps and everything. Yep. And there's lots of fun happening in the winter. They have no idea that the, the drain field's below their feet. Nope. It's a secret. You don't tell anybody. This was the best soils to be able to put in a Really good, permeable. Yeah, yeah. Literally, this is the end of the, end of the line right here. The water gets, gets spread out, goes down, underground through this. Through, through this. And, the, and the this. idea for the wetland was then, we've already removed enough of the nutrients that it's safe to put that into this. The issue here is nitrogen. There is no phosphorus. Phosphorus must be monitored, but there's no limit to that. And mostly gotcha. because that's a soil discharge. And as right. you know, phosphorus yeah. usually binds to soil pretty well anyway. So And nitrogen can really it just go right it on goes through right to the down river. into the streams. We can hear a stream over there. Yeah, it goes into the streams and then it becomes eutrophic because some of these streams are really nitrogen limited. And then yeah. suddenly nitrogen shows up and it's like lunchtime. Yeah, but also we're taking advantage of the natural uh, bacteria that's in in these interstitial for the areas. final treatment for, for that. Treatment. And and if it was an on-site system for an individual house, the logic behind that is that the the flow rate is so small that you don't have to worry about doing the treatment in the wetland in between. But here, because it's a, it's a commercial enterprise, 
and they have to have and they have higher flow rates, there needs to be pretreatment before you can put it into the groundwater district. And I see some tanks over there and there's some sampling gear, so this gets sampled. So we have to sample this needs to for the permit from Department of Environmental Quality, there must be a sample drawn once a month and then reported to the state to prove that you're it going it. into the drain field, but they go no into the drain field at the bottom because it's drained. Right, yeah, so it's it's to the drain field. If I had to eat snow up here, because who doesn't like eating snow? Yeah. I can eat the snow here yeah, on the surface. Be, yeah. This is okay, this is okay snow to eat. Yeah. At least in terms of human problems. It might be birds and bears. Well, and there's always that, yeah, Giardia, there's all that. Yeah, there's all sorts of ways of well, you me snow. When I go do my business at home, I'm also washing my clothes, not in the same place, mind you. Yeah. But, uh, but I, uh, I'm also taking showers, I have gray water, and black water. Black water, right? right. So this place, you know, no one's showering. I mean, some no people, one lives here, right? Yeah, no one lives here. Yeah. So and it's all black water. It's all it's black like, water. So it's essentially toilets and kitchen, which are the two yeah. most concentrated ones you have. So the wastewater that comes into the system here is a lot more concentrated, a lot hotter, a lot higher in nutrients. Typical domestic wastewater might be around 400 to 500 milligrams per liter COD, and maybe 40 to 50 okay. milligrams per liter of ammonia. And yeah. so this is rough, about two and a half times more COD and about five times more ammonia than we would have. Yeah. And the wetland then reduces that to almost a detection limit for the COD or for BOD, it's almost detection limit. So Bridger has a lot of, it's frozen most of the year. Yeah. And yeah. no one, and when it's frozen, everyone's using the toilet. Yeah. And when it's not frozen, no one's using the no, toilet. No, the only, it's only yeah. the permanent employees of which there's only a handful. So, right. so the flow rates be... vary dramatically. But between... yet you chose this place to run your experiment. Yes, because we had a great partner with Bridger Bowl. That was partnerships really... drive a lot of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. All right, well, this is awesome. This is a great tour. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm glad yeah. you had an opportunity to come out and talk to everybody about it, too. Yeah, awesome. Next time I go skiing up here, I'll know where my dookie goes.